Blair, Blair White, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so I want to start off with some questions so that people understand if they're not familiar with who you are, they understand who you are and where your perspective is, where you're coming from. So you are a transgendered woman. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, how old are you now and when did you start your transition? So I'm 28. I started my transition around 21, 22. And uh, I started my YouTube channel like directly after sort of that process began. So um, I've kind of transitioned in front of my YouTube audience. I've been very lucky to have a really uh, long lasting YouTube career and have a podcast now. Um, I'm a right wing commentator, political commentator, social commentary. So um, I'm definitely known as sort of the black sheep in the trans community. That's kind of what I always say, because I'm definitely not someone who has really any of the opinions of sort of like mainstream trans community activists, um, you know, so that makes things quite interesting and contentious sometimes on my channel. But, um, you know, I like having important conversations, hard conversations and, and talking about, uh, you know, issues that affect all people because the trans topic has really become such a central debate between the left and the right. Um, you would think that trans people are like half the population. Right. When in reality, they're such a small chunk, but it's become such a, you know, a political football. So um, I'm right in there in the middle of all that and always taking the slings and arrows for it, but that's fine. Um, yeah, and yeah. That, that's been, yeah. I mean, for you to, so you you do say you are right wing. You feel you are uh, like voting right wing. You're uh, ethically, morally, you know, all, the, all your stances are more on the right, you would say? Yeah, I would say center right is probably the best way to describe me, but I've never voted for a Democrat in my life. So um, that's just, you know, I am a Republican, so. Okay. And, and you know, you're, you're right. This has been, it's interesting how this has really become a front and center issue. And it wasn't, I mean, I've seen you, I've seen you on uh, Dave Rubin's show. I've seen you uh, just on your own show for years now. I mean, I've been watching some of your stuff here and there for, for a really long time. And I think well before this was really the big discussion. Now, for some reason, it, it has become the big center issue that a lot of people, especially I would say on the right, I, I feel like it's a little bit more on the right, more of a cultural issue coming from that side. I can see why. I think the left definitely made it a big issue, was really pushing for it, um, and still does in many, many ways. And so that is why it's become, I think, the center cultural issue. I would argue that the cultural issue on the left is still mostly racism. And so that is like what they put more front and center than any of the other cultural issues. But the trans issue seems to be front and center for the right. Do you feel like that or is that, or am I misreading that? Um, I think it depends who you ask. I think um, within sort of the confines of the corporate press, it's definitely more about race. There's no denying that. You have the George Floyd stuff, you have you know tensions being ignited on that front. Um, but when it comes down to sort of like, you know, the average everyday liberal who has went through, you know, the college system and is, you know, I think the trans thing, for whatever reason, is really overrepresented in the list of things that they care about. It's not that we people shouldn't care about it. It's that sometimes um, it's interesting noticing the difference between my lived experiences and just being a person who is trans and like watching people sort of argue past each other. And it's like, wow, it, it, I see just so many people on both sides that I'm like, wow, really no one has any idea what they're talking about. And in the meantime, there's really serious ramifications for um, where the issue is headed. You know, you have trans sort of affecting really every area of public life. You have the bathroom debate, you have the prison debate, you have trans kids. Um, and then sort of on the lesser scale, you have, you know, trans adults, you know, I, I don't agree with anyone who wants to control how I live my life or, you know, wants to say that I can't be trans or whatever that means, or, you know, transition the way I see fit. Um, but the, the kid issue has definitely become really hot button. And I think for a good reason, because I think that there are a little, a lot of really harmful things happening in the name of affirmative care for children. Yeah. And we'll get into that for sure. But I want to, so I might ask you some uh, overly personal questions. So if, if it's too personal, go ahead and stop me. But I do remember an episode watching uh, with you sitting down with Dave Rubin that you have not had bottom surgery. Is that right? Or have you done that now? No, I've elected to not do that just because I don't feel the science is really where people maybe claim that it is with that surgery. Um, and honestly, I don't know if it ever really will be. Um, and, you know, there, I just, I know way more people with, you know, 
negative complications that have happened, yeah. life-threatening complications. Um, I think that one thing to keep in mind when talking about this issue and with transition in general is that it's so heavily politicized that there's a lot of incentive to make believe that things are further ahead than they really are. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the surgery, that's one of them. You know, it's very risky. Um, it's not as perfected of a science as, you know, people claim that it is. And so for me, um, although people may see other ways in which I've transitioned as extreme, and I, I won't argue, I mean, I have done some extreme things in the name of transition, um, that just seems really, really extreme, especially okay. considering the risks. What um, percentage... I, I, so is it is it more common than not to do bottom surgery or is it at this point still more people are not choosing to go that road? Um, it's so hard to say. You know, another thing to keep in mind that makes this hard is that so many statistics when it comes to the trans issue, again, because things are so heavily politicized are also skewed. So. I tend to just go off of what I know in real life. I know probably like the largest pool of trans people of anyone that I know. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say it's probably around like 70, 30, like 70% don't, 30% do. Um, so yeah, I think that even though there's a lot of sort of posturing about how amazing the surgery is, I think a lot of people on the ground level kind of know like, let me stay away from that. Okay. But that's unfortunate also because a lot of people get sort of, um, for lack of a better word, tricked into doing certain things or misled that an outcome will be different for them. And then you have, you know, regrets and people wanting to take their own lives. So it's yeah. it's it's difficult. Well, I think it's important to, to bring this up. And I know that it's, it's more it's definitely a more personal conversation to have about bottom surgery. But I think it's important because I think a lot of people believe that most trans absolutely go through bottom surgery. Now, that is something everybody does, that it's a normal part of the trans experience. And, you know, of course, you and I both have anecdotal. I know you know way more trans people than I do, but the few that I know have not undergone tr uh, bottom surgery. Right. And you're saying, same for you, that the majority that you know have not. So it is not as prevalent as people think that it is, but it brings up some interesting parts of the debates because... There was a study that was conducted in England that uh, where a, a variety of people on both sides of the aisle from left, right to center were asked a variety of questions about trans issues. And when they were asked, for example, um, you know, they were asked, should trans people be given the same rights, you know, as everybody else? The vast majority, no matter which side of the aisle they were on, said, yes, absolutely. Trans people deserve all the same rights as anyone else. And they would ask, you know, should, and they would kind of go through all these questions. Should trans people be, should trans women be competing against biological women in sports? And it was the vast overwhelming on both sides of the aisle, left and right said no. There were just a few on the left that said, yes, they should be allowed to compete against biological women. When the bathroom issue came up asking, should a trans woman, for example, be allowed to use the same bathroom as biological women? The vast majority of pe it was it, the vast majority of people said yes, it was fine only if bottom surgery had been had been complete. So if the person had not had bottom surgery, then the results were very split, and it came down to more people on the left saying yes, it's fine, more people on the right saying no, absolutely not, they need to be using the biological male bathroom. And I think this brings us to the the real one of the real hot topics that's been um, I think in the front and center right now is the is about the prison debate. So right. we know about uh, the transgendered woman who did not have bottom surgery, who was in a prison with women and impregnated a couple of the inmates. And so now this has kind of brought this issue forward: like, should trans women who have not had bottom surgery be placed in a women's prison or in a men's prison? But I got to tell you, Blair. Looking at you, I would be very uncomfortable sending you to a men's prison. That would make me uncomfortable. If I were the judge. I, I would die. I would die. 100%. I, I mean, you look at violence and, and, and sexual violence that happens in prison. Someone who has, who looks like me can obviously not go to a men's prison. Um, and I, I just have to say this. I'm sure people will get angry, maybe certain people, but it's just real. Um, it's very interesting, the term trans woman, right? Because what we have now is this um, concept of self-ID, that you just are what you say you are, right? This is why I never say I'm a woman. Like maybe in real life scenarios, like if I'm you know, giving a legal document or something, I'm not going to correct someone and say, actually, I'm a trans woman. But, it, but I don't, when we're having these discussions in the public square and talking about you know science and facts, I'm not saying I'm a woman. I'm a trans woman. So you look at the individual who impregnated the women in the prison. I think it was in North Carolina or South Carolina. Um, and I can't see even a drop of transition that's taken place. I mean, this person, you know, 
presents 100% as male, but because they said they're a woman, they're allowed to go in the prison. So that's really where the problem lies. So the issue is not, you know, so much about like trans women and the variance levels at which they transition, for lack of a better phrase. It's more about this issue of self ID and how you can have a completely grown man who's lived his life as in a man his entire life, and then suddenly they get in trouble and it becomes actually I'm a woman. For multiple reasons. For one, these people that end up in these prisons for harming people tend to be predators. So, you know, predators go after their prey. So, what better situation than being, you know, one of the only, you know, men in a women's prison? Um, and, you know, if you really are on, um, you know, hormone replacement therapy, you can't really get a woman pregnant. I mean, I have not even been able to freeze my own DNA, not to be super graphic here, because I've been on this medication for so long that that's just gone. So if this person really was trans, I think it'd be a different story. Um, that's where the what I sort of see the solution is as funding for LGBT wards in prisons. You have this situation, it's a new day, it's 2022, and whether anyone likes it or not, there are people who exist sort of in the middle, at least visually, about of gender. And um, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be LGBT wards specifically in certain prisons. I understand every prison's not gonna get the funding for that, um, but that's when you kind of work out and send people where you can. Um, and I'm not the person, the expert to like, figure all the logistics out of that but mm -hmm. that's the closest i can get to a solution because the reality is yes someone like me would not survive more than a few days in a male prison but also because i do have my male genitalia i don't think it's completely appropriate for me to be in a women's prison either because i wouldn't want to make anyone uncomfortable and those are situations in which you're showering publicly that's something that i would never do a bathroom i know you cited um people for differently about bottom surgery yeah um I don't know. I don't really live my life with how people want me to like or care that much, to be honest. No one's seeing what I have in a public or a private bathroom stall. But I would never go into a shower, a locker room, a situation like that. I think that's disgusting. I think that's really offensive. And I think that I would be completely in the wrong to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it is very nuanced, right? Because I think a lot of people, what they want to do is they want to just outright ban biological right. males who still have male genitalia from being in a women's prison, even if you've been on hormone therapy and you present as a female like you do, clearly. So that is why for me, it'd be very, I would feel very uncomfortable sending you to a male's prison. I don't think you belong there. So if they made a law that said, well, no, but if you still have your male genitalia, then you're not allowed to be in a women's prison. And then furthermore, they say, and on top of it, because I know you say, well, if we're on hormone therapy, then I can't get a woman pregnant. But what if the government or people, especially the more conservatives that want to put bans on things, if they say you're not allowed to get state funded hormones? So if you can't get those hormones, then that changes things. And now you're in this. So, you know, how... How do you navigate, especially as somebody on the right, how do you navigate that? I mean, because there there does seem to be, I think, on the conservative side of things, a tendency to have a very black and white way of thinking. So it is, no, we're just going to put this ban in place and that's it. And if we discover, like, you know, with the bathroom issue, it's like, okay, if, if we know you have your male genitalia because you've been open about it and honest with your million YouTube subscribers, you know, and more then if somebody catches you going into a bathroom in the state of Texas, for example, into a women's room, they could certainly come after you. I mean, how do you navigate through that? How do you talk? How do you how do you present that and say it shouldn't be a ban, a blanket like black and white issue? Right. Um, and if there were ever a law you know, proposed to ban adults from transitioning or adults from doing what they want with their bodies, I'd be wholly against that. I'm all about bodily autonomy. Um, so. If that were to happen, I would definitely be against that. Um, I think that where I tend to focus is the kid issue, not really the adult issue. Yeah. Um, because all these other topics are so full of of, of nuance, and um, you know, this is, I guess, why I don't break the law. Like, I don't want to have to deal with what prison I'm going to. Um, but but yeah, you know, it's it's definitely there is a lack of understanding on the right about trans issues, and that's why I think that you know my channel has been so successful because I think I give people on that side of the political aisle sort of a peek into what it is to be a trans person who's not necessarily the caricature, the politicized, like blue hair, piercings, you know, trans women or women type of person that they're used to seeing because that is what the media portrays because those are the loudest among us. Um, and so I think that there aren't enough people actually bridging that understanding. Um, but again, you know, any bans on what an adult does with their body, I'm... Well, I think it's the bans. I, I, I don't know if anyone's discussing banning as much 
maybe there's some fringe people talking about banning adult, you know, procedures from adults. But I think a lot of the bans are about bathroom usage, you know, whether or not you're allowed to use a certain bathroom, whether or not you're allowed to use a certain locker room. I totally hear you on the locker room issue. That is definitely more, um, you know, it, that it's that's that's different than the bathroom issue. You know, those two are kind of separate, like one you're naked in completely in front of other people and one you're just going into a private stall and no one sees anyone's anything, you know, <laughs> typically, um, except maybe in the men's room, I suppose, when they're using the urinals. But, um, you know, so there's these bans and then just the prison ban, you know, saying, well, now you can't, uh, you know, wanting to in just wanting to put in place, I think, these blanket bans out of fear of a community that, as you mentioned, is tiny. I mean, just very, very small. This is, you would think half of America is trans or thinking about becoming trans the way that it's in the media, but it's really just a very, very tiny proportion of people. And I always ask people when they're, especially when they're so um, vocal, you know, and, and worried about it, which I really think is mostly social media and mostly political pundits. The vast majority of average people are not talking about this issue. They see something in the news and they say, well, that's wrong you know, when it comes to the prison thing or the bathroom thing. But beyond that, they're not really thinking of it. But, um, you know, it, so so that's just the, the this idea of banning, I, I think, your behavior. So not even just your surgery, your transition, but your, ac your actual behavior, where you can and cannot go based on how you identify. And, and really, and beyond that, based on what's in your pants. You know, that... Right. I mean, when it comes to bathrooms, like, again, I'm, I'm, I would be against any bans. You know, I'm legally female. I can't enter the bathrooms. Um, and again, this is like there's always a separation between like real life and like political discourse and online discourse In real life. Tr being trans is not even remotely an issue. Like it's not something I talk about in real life, really. It's not something that people around me talk about. My family and friends always talk about if they do talk about it, how much they forget that I'm trans. So there's that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that it's it's hard to sit here and really demonize people who just don't understand because I don't blame them because I get so fed up with the community. I get fed up with the sort of people that we elevate to positions of power to speak on our behalf, like people like Eli Ehrlich, um, who Matt Walsh was going after recently and I was going after. Um, and, and, you know, they only do see headlines about, like, the, the rapist in the prison. And, and I'm sorry, like, I think it should be individual cases. If you look at the person who did rape those women and get, get them pregnant, they absolutely should have never been placed in a women's prison. And someone should have used their brain and said, you know what, this is an individual thing. And this person clearly is not yeah. a woman or a trans woman. This is a man. And this is a person with a history of sexual violence. So why in the world would it make even a drop of sense to put them in a, in a women's prison? And that's where that the left has gone really far, right? I mean, it's just like saying... Yeah. Uh, well, if you identify, then you identify. Like, who cares about everything else? You know, right. all of the other evidence. Now you've said you're a woman. Now we're going to have to respect that. And it is what it is. And it's like insanity, right? I mean, just to say, oh, so this person claims to be a woman. So now you're going to put them in a woman's prison or this cl this person claims to be a woman. So you're going to let them go to women's, uh, you know, victim support groups and battered, right. you know, shelters. Like, how does this work? Right. I mean, it's, it's gone crazy, I feel like, on both sides. But I'm interested in you mentioned your personal experience. So you don't feel like despite all of this debate, how has it impacted your life? Um, not at all. Not in real life. Really? OK. Um, yeah, it, it, really not in real life. You know, I live my life doing what I want to do every day. I understand that I'm like a person with a certain amount of, for lack of better word, privilege, whereas, you know, I. I'm my own boss. I maintain my own lifestyle and I'm able to just wake up and say, well, what do I want to do today? And I do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but, you know, that also came with a lot of hard work. So it's not necessarily privilege. You know, I put a lot of work and effort and money into my transition to make sure I was comfortable enough to be able to do that and not go through my life having to look over my shoulder. If someone's going to be upset about me being in a bathroom, that's never been a thing literally ever. In fact, before I even medically transitioned, I would sometimes use a women's restroom because even back then, before a lot of the you know more physical changes, people were still reading me as female, and it still was a dangerous situation for me to be in a men's bathroom. In fact, I don't think as an adult I've ever been in a men's bathroom. So, um, yeah, it's it really comes down to individual people and this concept of one size fits all, right? Um, and this is an issue that you know one size fits all never fits in any situation, not for health, not for groups of people, not for communities, and so it shouldn't you know be here either, you know. Um, that's why I always say, you know, when it comes to the trans women in, in, in sports, 
Um, that's an issue where, you know, even though I don't agree with children transitioning, if someone transitions at 11 and never goes through male puberty, I'm not going to have as much of an issue with them playing on a women's sport as I would a 30 year old man who wake up, wakes up one day and says, I'm going to put a wig on and go play women's lacrosse. Right. That's different. So, you know, there, there's a, there's it's a great case by case. Yeah. yeah. And it's really difficult to make it case by case though. You know, people want to just kind of have this people, you know, it makes us comfortable, I think, just to, to have set rules. Yeah, that's just the human brain. We just want to well, know. People get, tribal. people get tribal. And I don't think that any community that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, poses themselves as a threat to women and children can really survive and really maintain a decent reputation. I mean, right now, the state of the trans community is one that many people perceive it to be a threat to children and a threat to women. Right. Women spaces, women in sports, um, women in college, and then children with the kid transitioning thing. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that that's just not a good thing. And I think that. I think the trans community should get a little more serious about who they prop up as the role models, the spokespeople, and the public faces of the community. Because as of now, all the ones that are really out there being propped up by the corporate press are people that have that as their agenda. That right. 11 year olds can transition medically, that trans women and women's sports is not a problem, even though people see with their two eyes that it's often a problem. You look at Leah Thomas, you know, the, the swimmer. Right. It's like, I don't know how anyone could look at that and be like, yeah, that's fair. I mean, you have to literally Somebody be. Right. Somebody's competed for high, three. Even then you can probably still hear her voice. Right. I mean, for three years competed as a male on the man on the men's team. It's ridiculous. Then, and then suddenly says, OK, you know, now I'm going to compete against the women and just, I mean, absolutely clobbers the women. In it's literally every... a scandal. It's horrible. Yeah. So let's talk about the, the children issue. I mean, you reached out to me saying, um, you know, because I'd been kind of dragged through on the, the Twitter sphere um, about my position on medical autonomy, which includes if the doctors and the parents and the patient are all in agreement, who am I to stand in their way? That is that is my position on medical autonomy. I don't believe a parent can do something to their children. I think that that, although that gets great too, because it's like, well, if you have a three-year-old, obviously you're making all the decisions for your three-year-old. Your three-year-old has no medical autonomy at that point. Your your 10-year-old has no medical autonomy. So there is, I think, a certain point, however, and certain certain medical treatments where the 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 child, the minor, would become consenting or co you know co consenting. I don't think a minor can also make their own medical decisions without their parental consent. We see that happening a lot. You know, a lot of areas are wanting to rip the parental rights away and say your child, your minor, once they at the age of twelve or thirteen are able to make their own medical decisions without even informing you, without even you being involved in the process. And I also think that that's wrong to take that, to take those medical decisions away from the family unit. Um, so, and to be clear, I'm also, you know, the doctors have to be on board with this as well. And maybe even more controls where it's numerous doctors need to be on board with it. It can't just be one or, you know, and ju or just the parents and the doctor and they're doing this to the child without their consent or the child wants it and then the and the parent has no say like all of that I'm against it's got to be a collective decision together all parties involved and um, of course you know this is such a hot topic that I was definitely uh, and, and Twitter's not the best place to have these kinds of discourse and I don't really right. care much about Twitter so I just kind of spout stuff off because I just yeah it's Twitter I don't really take Twitter seriously so um, of course, you know, there were people that were really upset about it, Matt Walsh included, and many others that were coming after me. And I appreciate you reaching out saying, even though you disagree, you d also did not feel like the backlash I was receiving was warranted. Uh, so well, I, I just felt that. as if it was very over the top and very extra, you know, the ways in which people were like sort of pretending as if you're advocating for like, I don't know, like some obscene mutilation of like a four year old or something. Like people right. were very dramatic about it. But I will say, um, I do wholeheartedly disagree. I think that unfortunately you're coming at it from a stance of kind of like a 90s, early 2000s era of sort of like when there actually were medical safeguards in place for, for this issue. And when this was something that was happening to a few kids in Sweden and far more liberal countries in which there really was a huge process to make sure it was the right decision. But unfortunately now, um, you know, the problem is twofold. So we talked mm -hmm. about how the heavily or how heavily politicized the issue is, right? Which is never good when it's a medical issue, should not be politicized. We saw what happened with, you know, COVID and the vaccines and how that was just such a nightmare and how there's so many things coming out now proving that the doctors were wrong, right? Well, this is also happening with the trans kid issue. So 
there's the politicization and then there's a social contagion aspect. So for whatever reason, and I think that there's going to be some studies that are made, you know, when it's safe to make them, you know, further along down the road, they're going to look back at this time and say, what was it that caused society to have this insane, almost mentally ill fixation on the trans topic? I'm not saying trans people are mentally ill. I'm saying the way people are fixating on this topic seems very strange. So unfortunately, doctors are very much compromised. This is, you know, the trans medical uh, industry is one that's on its way to become a billion dollar industry. So there's whenever there's huge money incentive for, you know, people to transition, both minors and adults, that's an issue. And then you have the fact that Parents are also compromised, you know, parents are being told a very false tagline, which is, would you rather have a dead kid or a trans kid? Now, picking between those two, I think it seems pretty apparent most people, if they're decent human beings, would pick the trans kid. Unfortunately, this is a false dichotomy. This is not only telling the kid that if you can't transition, you're going to die, which is a very toxic thing to implant in their head. You know, these aren't just conversations happening with the parent and the doctor. They're happening with the kid in the room. You know, the the trans issue is one that historically has only been present in very young males. So it's something that you saw in little boys and some of those people, some of those boys grew up to transition and and were content with it. Mm -hmm. Now you have it happening almost exclusively in the teenage girl population, the same population that gets fixated on cutting, on uh, self-harm, on anorexia, bulimia, all of those things. Um, And you have a huge crossover with autistic children. Why are there autistic kids being overrepresented in the trans statistic. You have the fact that there are three times more trans kids than adults. That's very strange because again, up until very recently, this is something that would afflict a very small amount of children and a very, very small amount of children were actually put through the process to transition. Back when there were safeguards and back when there was actually, you know, right now they're pushing for the activists are pushing for a complete demedicalization of transgender as a topic while also medicalizing it and encouraging kids to undergo surgery. So what they do is they'll call me true scum, which is a phrase for a trans person who believes that you have to have gender dysphoria to be transgender. Now, again, up until very recently, because of activist push, that was the standard. You had to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. You had to go through a therapist. You had to even, in a lot of cases, live as that gender for up to a year before you even got a surgery. Um, That's really not the case anymore. Now the tagline is that you don't need just for you to be trans. A lot of these um, therapists are activists. Um, And so it's a really, really dangerous pipeline that these kids are falling into. Um, The topic of detransitioners. So I've interviewed a lot of detransitioners on my channel that happen to be very young teenagers, very young adults who fell into the trans thing as young teenagers, underwent double mastectomies, underwent irreversible procedures. Some of them have uh, voices that are permanently altered, you know, facial hair that's going to be there. Um, And they all have one thing in common, which is the internet funneled me into this. So you have these young kids who are secluded, who are lonely, who maybe don't come from the best family homes, who maybe are weird. You know, a lot of them are autistic. They don't really understand social interactions. They're being told by people in these communities online that all these things make them transgender, that being feminine simply makes you transgender if you're a male or being masculine makes you a boy if you're a girl. This is not the case, obviously. You know, tomboys exist, feminine gay males exist. And so, you know, just the idea and the concept that someone as young as 12, which is the age that a lot of these kids are getting double mastectomies, can consent to that, um, which is permanent and irreversible. Um, You can get breast implants, but breast implants are not breasts. Um, You know, it's just like if you can't consent to sex, I don't see why you can consent to changing your sex, especially because when you're transgender, you're signing up for lifelong medicalization. I think people think it's a process that you do it and then you're done and then it's a wrap. I will be on medication for the rest of my life because I'm transgender. There is not a stopping point. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely can see where, uh, I mean, I, I don't have much trust in the medical, you know, big pharma and in the medical industrial complex, for sure. I've been a, a big vocal critic against the medical industrial complex. But for me, the solution hasn't been to ban it. The solution wasn't to, like for the COVID vaccines, for example, I didn't look to ban them. It was more about giving more options for information that wasn't available. They're just hindering information. And I agree that from what I'm what I'm hearing about with the experience that many parents are having when they have a teenage girl and she's cutting herself and she's suicidal, seemingly suicidal, and now she says she's trans and then they kind of go through this process, that once they show up to these, you know, to the to the therapists to figure to go through the gender affirming care that they call it, whatever however they label it. Um, 
that they're being told only one way, right? That there's only one option. And it is that you must transition your child or have a dead child, like you're saying. And so to me, the problem is, is right at that point, right? The problem is not that these parents are seeking relief for their child, that their child is going through whatever their child is going through. Teenagers go through phases. I got in big trouble with the left when I was talking about this with trans issues saying, I, you know, I think a lot of teens just go through phases and they think they're trans and they're not, right? And then I got, you know, I got the same, I actually got more backlash from the left, certainly, than I did on my issues on, you know, my stances on trans issues than I, I did on the right with this particular issue. Um, but, you know, the, the issue to me is right at that point. It's that when they shut down discourse, it's when they shut down information, it's when you as a person think this is your only option, whatever that medical option is, they're making it sound like it's this or else, right? And they did it with the vaccines. They do it, and they're doing it with this issue. And I'm sure they're doing it with many, many more issues that have yet to come to, to light. So it's more about, to me, the information. I think if a lot of parents were given the information and they were told, this isn't your only option. There are other options. There are other ways. This is the truth. These are the facts. These are the stats. The stats are your kid is more likely to grow out of this thinking yes. than to remain, right? I mean, that's what we know. Um, well, and I mean, that's, that's what you and I know. I know a lot of people on the left are yeah. unwilling to recognize that. And that to me is a big problem. Right. Yeah, that is the problem. So like I said, a lot of these doctors and these therapists are very much compromised. They become activists. Even I, as an adult, when I transitioned in my early twenties, um, I walked in to get a prescription for estrogen. And I walked out 10 minutes later with one. I was never given um, any information about side effects. I was never given you know, the information that this is something that is ha I have to be on this medication for life. Um, you know, People are not being told that, and this is the problem also, that the internet separates us into algorithms, right? So yeah. I can say something like puberty blockers, one of the huge side effects that have come out recently are that it causes brain swelling and vision loss in children. This is something that's come out recently. If you tell this to the average leftist, they have no idea about this because we are so segregated by our algorithms and this information just doesn't filter through. Well, and they'll call you a bigot too. I mean, on top yeah, of it. They'll right? bigot, and they'll call you a bigot, 100%. <laughs> um, and I think just the entire concept that, you know, a kid knows who they are enough to have something permanent done to their body is just strange. And so normally I do agree that bans are not the answer, but I think when it comes to like protecting kids from cutting off their body parts or permanently altering their bodies, I'm not going to be upset about a ban. We have so much bans that I'm like, why is that banned? That's not the one I'm going to pick my fight with. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, you have these kids, you know, there's really, really disturbing photos of people coming out of surgeons' offices. And I know surgical images injury is often jarring, but right. I'm not talking about the actual double mastectomy scars. Those are crazy. But also like some of these kids have cutting marks on other parts of their bodies. And it's like, how does this get through? And it's because there is no system put in place right now to, to you know, safeguard because mm -hmm. When you have a therapist who even hints at the possibility that possibly this child is confused and not actually trans, they're accused of trying to put the kid through conversion therapy. So leftists, the way they gain power is through language, it's through words. They will reorganize language however they have to to get their political you know, goal. And this is one in which if you push back on the idea that a kid is trans at all, that yeah. is effectively conversion therapy. In fact, there's a law that was passed in Canada, which oftentimes on this issue, Canada does something first and then we do it second, at least in the blue states. So now if there's a therapist in Canada who tells a child, maybe you should consider that you're autistic. Maybe you should, con should consider that this is a trauma relating to the time when you, when you were molested when you were six years old. Maybe you have a misconception about what a woman or what a man is that is considered legally to be conversion therapy. And you can actually go to jail for that. So there's incredible incentive to push these kids through the pipeline rather than pump the brakes. And I think that's where the issue is because, yeah. and I think it's indicative in the fact that the entire concept of a detransitioner a few years ago wasn't a, a concept. And that sounds crazy. And that sounds like a very black and white statement, but it, it's true. When I transitioned, I looked up people who regret transition, detransitioners. I was trying to do my own due diligence. You couldn't find any stories about detransitioners. There was maybe one, mm -hmm. like from the 90s. Now you have Reddit pages full of tens of thousands of kids who are saying, I can't believe this happened to me. I can't believe I've removed my breasts. I can't believe I can't orgasm. I can't believe I have a permanently deep voice that can never be fixed. These are things that, I mean, I can't imagine as someone who is very much happy with my transition and with my choices, I can't imagine the existential dread that must occur when you realize 
it was all a mistake. It was all a lie. And how much you must not ever be able to trust yourself again after you made such a huge decision. But the truth is they didn't really make that decision because in my opinion, minors can't make that decision. You can't consent to that. That's what a doctor who is an activist pushes you through. And, you know, Another thing is that these surgeries are very expensive, right? So there are situations in which insurance covers it and people are getting these surgeries for free. But in a lot of places like Texas, for example, that's not the case. You know, um, it was about almost 20 grand for me to do the things that I've done and I've done less than most people. So these kids and these parents, and they are a cash cow as well. And so it's just this really, really every, it's a perfect storm of like just all the wrong things happening with these kids. I mean, do you know of very many people who are actively transitioning their minor? Uh, no, but that's because I don't know any really parents. I don't really have any mm -hmm. friends that are parents. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how common it actually is. I mean, I, I do feel like the discourse around it makes it sound like everybody's doing it. Like everybody's oh, just... I do have one anecdote, actually. Yeah. Um, so I have a nephew in high school and he has said that every year there's basically double the amount of trans people. And so it, it'll go from like five people to 10 to 20 every single year of his high school experience. Whereas for me, there was zero when I was in school. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, for you sure. can chalk it up partly to increase social acceptance, but I don't think that paints the whole picture. Right. I think that, um, you know, it's hard being a kid and, and you're looking for answers and you're looking for community. And when you have an online community that, is giving you these answers, um, yeah. it's hard to not fall into it, especially if you don't have a close relationship with your family or at school or right. et cetera. Well, I definitely agree. I do think that a lot of teenagers are saying I'm trans. I definitely think that that is a, that is a trend that we're seeing increase for sure. I just don't know if they're then actively seeking to medically transition, whether it be hormones or whether it be surgeries. I don't know if they're taking it to that level. I think a lot of them just they know it's like the cool thing to say I'm trans. You're going to get some attention. Teenagers are often looking for attention. They they want to fit into a group. They don't feel like they do. They fit in over here. It feels good, so they do it. But And I do see the pressure in that, that there then can be then wanting to take it to the next level after that. And I would hope that the adults around them would say, this is a phase. You're just going through a phase. You're not really trans. The parents that have trans children who legitimately are trans that then transitioned in adulthood they're, they showed uh, being trans way younger than just their teenage years. I mean, I, for you personally, when would you say you knew you were trans? Well, I think that um, there's a difference between knowing I was trans and, and knowing inherently I was different, right? So yeah. when I was, you know, as early as preschool, I noticed that I was different. I noticed that I wasn't comfortable necessarily being called he. And um, I know that's something that is like hard to explain to someone who doesn't experience gender dysphoria. I get it. Um, but that's why it is, in my opinion, a mental disorder. It's something that afflicts a certain amount of people. And if right. you don't, but you don't really get it the same way that I don't understand, you know, people with uh, social anxiety right. or anything else. Um, but I don't think that I was able to really register that it meant transgender until my late teens and early adulthood. Um, but I always say, you know, people say, well, didn't you know that you were trans when you were, when you were younger? I knew I was different when I was younger. But even if I knew I was trans and even if I was growing up in a time where the word transgender was, you know, in the common discourse and I've heard of it and I had a loose idea of what it was, mm -hmm. I still don't think that would have changed my ability to consent to changing my body because if you think about it, you know, we've also, we've talked about the nuances of how I've transitioned, how I've gotten certain surgeries and not gotten certain others. That also took, <coughs> excuse me, <Yeah. coughs> that also took me growing as a person and as an adult to understand that that surgery wasn't right for me. If I would have, you know, been given a menu of things I can do at 12 or 13, I probably would have, you know, right. picked a lot of different things. Um, and that's also the the difficulty with, with that. And, you know, also gender expression exists on a spectrum, right? Like I'm not one of the people who thinks that gender itself is a spectrum, um, but gender expression surely is. Sure. And so that changes for people wildly over time as well. And yeah. so when you're making decisions permanently for something that fluctuates, that's also a problem, which is why even adults who get, you know, things like, you know, breast implants or, you know, more cosmetic, less serious surgeries, um, they often have a change of heart as well because they don't, you know, like how it looks or whatever. And they can go through a lot if they can't afford to change it or um, right. if it can't be changed. And so and those are very minor in comparison to like, you know, changing your reproductive system. 
Right, which most don't seem to be doing anyway, right? That's not, I, I, again, it's like, I think people kind of say, okay, if somebody's transitioning, whether they be a teenager or an adult, that they're cutting off their body part, you know, they're cutting off their penises. I mean, that's kind of how they're making it sound. I don't well, think- Well, a lot of the kids are actually, once they become um, 17 or 18, it depends on the state. A lot of them are because those are the people that have been on puberty blockers so long that they don't actually have any sexual function regardless, because if you're mm -hmm. on puberty blockers and then on hormones, you can't orgasm. Um, you don't have erections. You, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm being graphic here, but it's kind of necessary. Right. So um, what, what states allow it under the age of 18? Because I was under the impression that none of them do allow for bottom surgery unless you are an adult. Um, I don't have a list on me, but I do know that the place where I got my surgeries yeah. operate does bottom surgeries on males as early as 17. Um, to get it at 17, it's a case by case basis. Um, but it's 18 is the floodgates are open. Right. Um, so, you know, there's also other things like double mastectomies, I think can be not as traumatizing, but quite traumatizing to have that done and then regret it. Um, underage girls are getting, uh, hysterectomies. Um, are and they just... though? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that is actually, I haven't, I haven't read or heard about that actually happening that the, really what it is, is the puberty blockers, the hormone therapy and the top surgeries. That that is what they're doing if anyone's under the age of 18. But the minute you have your 18th birthday, yeah, you're right. I mean, suddenly, magically, you can consent to everything, you know, like a magic wand in your brain. You can suddenly now you're adult enough to, you know, it's it's an arbitrary timeline that one day suddenly, magically, you can you're smarter than you were the day before. I, I yeah. mean, I, and I understand people don't, their brains don't fully develop until they're 25. I agree. But I also don't think that means we should say then you're not an adult until you're 25. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I transitioned before 25. I think that anyone who says I should have waited till 25 is kind of crazy. I was an adult, right? If I can yeah. go fight in a war or drink alcohol, I can get a surgery. Right. But um, there are hysterectomies done on minors in certain situations. So a lot of the times when you press these clinics, um, and this is why another reason people are very, very upset about these clinics is because they give misleading information. So they, when called out, will change their guidelines. It comes down to the individual places. Um, the place where I got my surgeries, which it's actually a little bit of a controversy because I called them out. Um, I was visiting them recently because um, I was taking my friend to get a surgery who was an adult. I was taking care of her. And uh, the front desk woman came up to me and started, I don't know why she thought I would be sympathetic to this, but she did. She started talking about how due to the recent laws in Texas stating that minors couldn't get uh, these surgeries anymore, they had to cancel on a 13 year old who was getting a double mastectomy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's strange because their website never advertised that they go that young. In fact, the website said 16, but in talking to people that worked there, it was as young as 13. So there, there, there's just a lack of like structure with how this is happening and which is why people are getting access to things they shouldn't and not getting access to things they shouldn't. Um, it's like the wild, wild west of how, how the trans right. is going right now. So I do just one, again, we're running out of time here, but um, one thing I do want to ask, I know that there are definitely people who regret transitioning, the detransitioners, right? And we hear their stories. We definitely hear of, you know, people regretting their double mastectomies and going, you know, so this absolutely happens. But on the flip side, isn't there also a community of people who wish that they could have transitioned earlier? I mean, for you, like you said, you read as a woman, you don't, you're, you're privileged in that way as a trans woman. You don't, no one questions your womanhood, but others, if they were to have gone through puberty and they were a six foot four male, I mean, look at Leah Thomas, right? For example, will never read as a woman, really, right? Always will have very masculine traits, being very tall, very built, uh, jaw lines, you know, everything about Leah Thomas reads male, unfortunately for her. So she's right. not going to be able to fit in. And this is not just her, you know, that's an example of somebody, uh, people might be very unsympathetic to, to Leah Thomas, but I'm just using as an example, the physical right. type. And we see many others in the same. I mean, I, I have only a handful of trans friends, not many at all, but the ones I have, they don't read as female as much as they would like to read as, as female. So there, I, wouldn't there also be a group of people that wish, you know, and puberty happens in your teenage years wish that they could have stopped that process earlier so that they could read as a female and have the life you're experiencing. 
Right. Absolutely. That is a common thing. Um, a lot of adults that maybe look a certain way wish they would have started sooner. Um, but I don't think that changes a child's capacity to consent to permanent surgeries. I don't think that um, someone's looks are a reason enough to say, oh, then you should have been sterilized at 13. Because that's another thing people don't talk about enough. You are sterilized when you undergo these procedures and these hormone treatments. Um, so I think the fact that it's easier to sterilize a 13 year old than a woman in her like 20s who wants to have a hysterectomy or wants to have her tube tied. Sorry. Um, I think that's like a really strange imbalance. You know, um, I understand that like hormones affect looks and, 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 you know, there's luck involved and there's genetics involved and all of that, but I just can't get to the place where, because I know someone who is six one when she would rather be five, six, if she would have been on blockers, mm -hmm. that that trade off meant that she should have been, you know, sterilized as a teenager, you know. What what exactly is sterilizing? Just so that I know, because I was under the impression that like hormone blockers just uh, or, pu or puberty blockers just prevent you from going through puberty when you were due to go through puberty. So rather than and we see and that's biological that happens naturally as well. Like some girls get their periods at twelve and some don't get them until they're sixteen, and so right. these if puberty blockers would kind of delay from twelve to let's say later. Right. But if you're male and you're on puberty blockers, that means you never develop, you know, the ability to produce semen. OK. Which means that you then go on hormones right after puberty blockers. Then you've never had the capacity to have children. So that's another huge factor of it. To me, that's another big line that's drawn is like, does a teenager have the right to sterilize themselves? Can they truly consent to like deciding at that age that they never want to have children, that they never want to continue their bloodline? Um, you know, I didn't want kids at 13. I don't think anyone wants kids at 13. So that's like an easy, no, I don't want kids answer right. when you're that age. But right. as an adult, it's like, I don't know about that. So, yeah. you know, if the trade off is like your looks, which can be changed to some capacity um, and not being able to have kids, et cetera, it's kind of like, I, I just don't see the, the trade off there. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I guess for me, that's why I just think it's still such a case by case issue. I don't, I don't feel comfortable ripping the rights away from parents and youth and doctors when it comes to medical decisions, really for any medical decision. So in that way, you know, maybe I'm extreme. I, I, as long as everybody's consenting. So again, I don't believe you can do something to someone and then it's okay. You know, people were coming at me, like you were saying, the people that kind of went extra on it and they were like, well, Kim, so you're fine with kids, you know, parents abusing their children by putting cigarette butts out on them because it's their kids. They can do whatever they want. It was like, no, uh, we're talking about medical, you know, consent. I, I do think that there even could be an age where there, you must get co-consent on certain things like, you know, like vaccines, for example, when we just went through this COVID vaccine thing, uh, maybe teenagers, maybe there is an age where you have to co-consent with your parents. And if you say no and your parent says yes, you don't have to do it and vice versa, right? It's got to be a co-consenting relationship because I do think, you know, this arbitrary day that one day you turn 18 and suddenly you have full autonomy when your parents had 100 percent control of you prior to that to me is a little bit bizarre. You know, maybe it could be like a co a co situation once you hit a certain age. Um, but, you know, I feel uncomfortable ripping those rights away from people and saying we're just going to ban it entirely no matter what. I don't know you. I don't know your situation. I've never met your doctors. I haven't been with you your entire life. I don't know if you truly are one of those very suicidal teens who is truly trans, who's truly suffering, who's truly suicidal. And here I am going to say, nope, you can't do whatever it takes because some people over here are using your experience as an excuse for their behavior when their behavior is not actually in alignment with the reality, you know, with people who are actually genuinely going through that. Because, you know, I do think that there are teens that are genuinely suicidal and they genuinely are it is for them. They're trying to they're trying to remove their breasts. They're trying to cut them off. Buck um, Angel, he was he interviewed uh, a woman who actually was talking about her experience as a teenager trying to, you know, do those types of things to herself, trying to mutilate herself. And so I do think that's a real experience for some people. And I guess that's why for me, it's so difficult to say, I know better than you. And so therefore, I'm just going to make the decision for you, even though I've never met you. I don't know your situation. I know nothing like I just don't think politicians and bureaucrats should have anything to do with that. But I, I do think there could be controls in place, legal controls like forcing more information to be given, you know, like true informed consent, which is lacking in so many things, not just this issue, but in so many medical issues, forcing yeah, informed consent. 
there's truly no informed consent when it comes to the trans issue. I mean, I, again, was never given any information. I, everyone I talked to was given basically no information. Um, honestly, the way that, you know, doctors act when it comes to this topic is they very much behave like mad scientists. Yeah. And again, I think there's going to be studies done on the psychology of what's happening here in the future when it's more acceptable to do that. Um, and, and yeah, you know, it is hard. Like the idea of like 18 being that imaginary number, like I get that completely. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that when you have these kids who, like you said, truly are suffering, like, you know, attempting to remove their breasts in the bathroom and stuff, I think that's way more indicative of like a psychological issue aside from trans, to be honest, you know, because I understand the suffering of being trans more than anyone. There was a, or maybe not more than anyone, it's a dramatic statement, but I understand it quite well. Right. There was a point where I couldn't even leave the house because I was experiencing such debilitating gender dysphoria. I never wanted to remove a limb myself in the bathroom. I never wanted to cut myself. I never wanted to harm myself. Um, and so, you know, if, if a child is like literally harming themselves and threatening to kill themselves, I think you should address that issue by itself before... Right putting them through surgery, which also has like, there's post-surgery depression, you know, like I wanted my surgery so bad. And then I got them and I immediately, it's been studied quite well, post-surgical depression. It's like, I had this horrible feeling immediately after I was like, what did I do yeah. now? I'm back to happy, but it's like putting these kids through all that. I just, I can't, I can't wrap my head around it, especially knowing firsthand what transition is, what it does to your body, to your psychology, to, to your brain, to your behaviors. Um, it's like knowing the, the the process firsthand and thinking of a kid going through it right. is like the most demented thing I could like think of. Yeah, I mean, I understand. I, I totally understand your perspective on it because it's something I would never do personally. I mean, I would hope I would never do that. I would hope that when I have a kid, I'm not in that position like some parents where it is uh, devastating. I only know of one parent. You know, I, I ask this, this question of everybody. Do you know anybody who's actively transitioning their child? I only know of one parent um, who did actively transition their minor, not a child, but, you know, somebody who was under the age of 18, a minor. And um, they had gone through years and years and years of a lot of uh, trying everything, trying absolutely everything prior to this point, dealing with a very suicidal child, somebody who they had rescued her several times from actually attempting to commit suicide, not just empty threats, actual threats. And it was something that, you know, these are very, very conservative Republican parents and and, and the, the types of people who would ne who would be totally, you know, uh, against all of this had it not happened to them. And I just feel that. So that's where I guess my perspective comes from, was I just say, I just don't know everybody's situation and I don't pretend to know. But I, I agree there is a problem, right? There is a problem with this, like just, yeah, like a, a grown man suddenly saying, I'm a woman, and then getting into a woman's prison, just accepting it at face value without questioning, without really pre pushing back, without giving more information. Like that, the culture that is that is that is being created around that really does need to be reined in on big time, right? I mean, that is a big problem that we're seeing. We just can't say, oh, so now you're a turtle. So I guess you're a turtle, like whatever you want to be. Uh, it's also the medicalization of children in general. You know, I often think about how quick people are to put their kids on SSRIs or, you know, medication because they're not behaving well in school. You know, I was right. actually one of those kids when I was young um, that, you know, I grew up with a really turbulent family life. Like my family kind of sucked, to be honest. And so because of that, I was a depressed little kid. I was a kid who was not happy or felt safe. And so my behavior would often reflect that in class and at home. And my mother's solution, rather than finding out, you know, or rather than looking inward rather and saying, right. well, maybe I'm creating an unhealthy environment here, um, was to take me to a doctor who then, you know, drugged you immediately up. said, right. you have OCD, you have ADD, you have ADHD, all these things that I do not have as an adult. And I know that now, um, but I was put on this medication and, yeah. you know, there, there, there is something with like just putting kids on medication and not really thinking twice about it. Um, that I think is a problem. And that's something that's been on the rise yeah. The trans out of it. yeah. I mean, yeah. and it's a great point. I mean, so maybe you are right. I mean, maybe we do need to put more restrictions on the doctors. I mean, I, I'm really uncomfortable with it, but I understand. I mean, I get the point because I do, I agree with you. They go, it, it, the answer in our medical environment and our, the way that they're thinking is always just drug them up or do a right. surgery, right? It's never actually 
go deeper into the problem, figure it out. Or maybe it's just the kid's got a lot of energy and needs to go running right. <laughs> more often. You know, exercise right. your kid. Uh, and I, so I agree that there's definitely a problem in our medical community. They have just like run amok with just drug them up. And we saw this, I mean, from my perspective, I don't know where you fell on the COVID vaccine issue, but from my perspective, it was just like, dose them up, dose them up, dose them up, you know, four jabs, right. five jabs, six jabs. Now it's yearly, says Fauci, right? So, right. I, I mean, I find that so, it's insane. It's, it's totally demented. It's, and now you right. have all these studies coming out saying, oh, actually this population probably shouldn't have had quadruple right. vaccine. Oh, if you're seven months pregnant, the vaccine wasn't safe. Oops. And then people are left to deal with the turmoil. So that's really all I'm, yeah. you know, trying to do with the trans side of it is say, I see an avalanche here coming. And if I can do anything to, you know, stand in the way of that, then I am going to try to help however I can. Yeah. I mean, I, I get your point. I get your point. I also just think we can't stop people from making horrible life decisions. <laughs> I mean, if they're going to make terrible life decisions, I don't know. But, you know, you're right. Teens, we should try to protect kids from making bad choices as best as possible uh, yeah. because they they're they're not they're not adults. They're not aware. They, they don't even if they are 18, 19, they haven't had the experience in life that many of us have had. But I'm sure then the 60 year olds say that about us, right? And they're like, oh, exactly. those youngins, they don't have the life experience. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> right. uh, Blair, this has really been great. Thanks for chatting yeah. with me about this issue. I think, um, you know, it definitely is a front and center issue. Uh, people are talking about it a lot. And there is a lot of nuance there, I think, for many of these, uh, many aspects of this conversation, like the prisons, mm -hmm. the bathrooms, right? These are all very nuanced. And it's best for people to kind of hear those arguments, hear those conversations and um you know and then maybe help with the discourse when they when they go to the polls when they vote right yeah and thank you for actually having the conversation because a lot of the times this issue is so heated that people once they start to get that heat a little bit they're like i'm staying away from this topic this is just too insane and i'm sure there <laughs> probably was a party that was like oh my god but you know it's good to just have this discourse so uh thank you so much for having me yeah i mean it, it for sure i've had those feelings coming from the left and the right of the the heat i felt the heat on this topic i've basically been wrong in everybody's eyes <laughs> on both sides i relate to that i relate to that so all right blair thank you you can find blair blair white go to her youtube channel she's got over a million subscribers there um, lots of videos, great video, really interesting conversation. So be sure to check her out there.